Welcome to the Future Tech edition of the Finding Genius podcast. Forget frequently asked questions, forget common sense, common knowledge, or Googling for information. How about advice from a genius in their field instead? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% are the geniuses of their profession. Richard has made it his life's mission to interview the geniuses of their fields in areas such as AI, 3D printing, quantum computing, blockchain and Bitcoin, and more. Don't miss out on amazing podcasts with geniuses. Review us on iTunes or wherever you listen and go to futuretech.findinggeniuspodcast.com and subscribe today. Hello, this is uh, Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius podcast. This is the Future Tech edition. I have uh, Denise Ruffner. She's the uh, head of business or the uh, chief business officer at Cambridge Quantum Computing, a famous company in the quantum computing world. So, Denise, thanks for coming. It's my pleasure. Happy to be here today. Yeah, uh, you know, I know the public has heard a lot about quantum computing, but it's short on details. But if uh, you know, to, to start with, um, tell me about Cambridge. What's the mission and the premise of the company, and then maybe we'll get into some of the nitty gritty of how quantum computing works. So Cambridge Quantum Computing is, uh, I think, a very interesting company. It's a startup. It's based in the UK with offices in Japan and the US as well. And what we do is we do two different things. Um, first off, we develop software for quantum computers to help other companies take advantage of this new technology or this new emerging technology. And then secondly, we have a security device uh, to help people who want to protect themselves about the, uh, against the potential of quantum computer breaking their current security environment. Really? Huh. Yeah. Can we, can we start with that? What's, uh, what's that about? Sure. So quantum computers have the potential to become extremely powerful computers. And those comp and quantum computers can and will be able to break today's current encryption protocols. And so all of us in the world, but especially corporations that have sensitive data, need to start thinking about quantum computers and planning how they can protect um, their infrastructure against quantum computers. So we've developed a device, and we've done this with uh, two very famous scientists, uh, Simone Severini and Fernando Brandao, who's a professor at Caltech. And we have a device uh, that actually has a mini quantum computer inside of it at room temperature that you can deploy as part of your infrastructure and use to protect against quantum intrusion. Oh, any, you know, I know, I'm sure a lot of it's proprietary, but what can you say about how it works? Oh, it's a mini quantum computer. Um, and uh, it can use um, quantum physics to generate, for example, quantum keys. Um, and those are basically um, not hackable because they're not using math to generate them. You're using quantum physics. Okay. I guess it's kind of like generating a truly random number or a truly random key pair. That's exactly. not uh, based on like elliptical curve math and things like that. Exactly. Exactly. You've got it. Okay. Interesting. So what's a, so the protection is that, you know, people would normally choose keys that can be hacked or at least, you know, with a lot of effort could be hacked or if you had a quantum computer, you could hack it, but keys generated by this system are at a level above where I guess no one can hack them or uh, would you need like a really, you know, like a 500 qubit machine in order to hack them? Like what's the, What's the guess at the threshold of what it would take to crack the level of keys that you can create with the machine? You know, that's a really great question, and I don't know the answer to it. But it would, you try not to say unhackable, because it's an invitation to hack. But um, I would say it's very robust, and it would have to be a sophisticated quantum computer um, if it was all able to get at it. And the fact that it uh, operates at room temperature, I mean... Is it a quantum computer itself, or it, it's somehow able to use the properties of, you know, quantum effects to create this key that, that again, is uh, very difficult to hack, but it's not really acting as a, a quantum computer itself? It, it really is. A, it's, a, it's a mini single-use quantum computer. Uh, it uses photonics 
And part of the genius of the invention is the photonics at room temperature. Whenever I tell someone, oh, there's a quantum computer inside, they go, how big is this thing? You know, is it as big as a room? And is it super cooled? And I have to explain that it's actually just a 4U uh, or 5U box that you can slide into your server rack. And it runs just in a, in a typical uh, server environment, which is room temperature. So it's, it's this hmm. amazing device. It, you said it's a one-time use and then you throw it away? or oh, No, no, it's whatever. not a one-time use. But I, I, oh. I meant that it's, um, it's not a quantum computer like that you're writing code for and, you know, kind of these big devices that many of the manufacturers have. This is for the crypto cryptography applications um, simply. Oh, so it only has one type of use. Okay. It's just very narrow, yeah. but it's good at what it does. Gotcha. Exactly. Interesting. Okay. What kind of applications or what kind of customers do you see that are starting to use it? Is it at that stage? So it is at the stage we've just started producing it in-house and we have a lot of different people um, looking at it and trying it out. So we published a a blog in December with IBM who had used it on their cloud uh, to generate keys for a product called Key Protect. Um, and uh, we have a lot of other cloud providers looking at it. We have telecoms looking at it, credit card companies, banks. There's a lot of interest in it. And so it's just right now this like technology on the edge that's just emerging um, and people are really looking at it and trying to evaluate how to use it and how they're going to implement it. Hmm. Okay. And then what about on the, uh, you know, the, well, the regular, regular old regular. fashioned quantum computing side. Yeah. What's the, what's the state of the art there? The state of I know the it's art. not regular or old fashioned. No, no, no. I'm laughing too, because it, you know, the, the invention that I'm talking about called the Iron Bridge is really exciting. And then you go to quantum software and it just doesn't seem so exciting after all, even though it's really exciting into itself. Um, so in that area, so Cambridge Quantum Computing, the company I work for, is really interesting. Um, I'm going to add some color. It's, it's actually one of the oldest quantum startups. So we started in 2014. Um, and we've had five years, really, where we've invested in our science. Uh, so we have a scientific staff of about 70 people. We have a total of about 100 people in our company. So we have a huge bench of scientists and of different research expertise, um, more so in comparison to other companies. So if you look, for example, at our quantum finance team, we have a huge team that is probably bigger than major companies in doing quantum finance. So we have an amazing amount of expertise under our roof. Um, I think the most interesting product we have, or it's hard to say the most interesting, and I, I'm sure I'll get beaten up for saying that, but one of my favorite products is a product that we call Ticket. And that's a software package that you can use and you can write your quantum algorithms on top of it. And what Ticket does is it gives you the ability to move your software um, and run it on different devices. So what's happening in quantum computing is that there's a race. There's probably a hundred different companies or universities that are all developing quantum computers. And what happens is that each of these quantum computers generally has its own different operating software. And so if you want to write an algorithm, and then you want to run it on a different device, generally you have to rewrite the software. And so what Ticket does is it provides a platform, and we work with all the different manufacturers or the different people developing quantum computers. And if you write your algorithms on top of Ticket, then you can move pretty seamlessly. You change one small line of code and you can now run your algorithm on a different device. So we say it gives you uh, device independence or it's retargetable. So it will allow you to take what you've written on, let's say, IBM's quiz kit and run it on a different device, even though that device may not um, be programmed in quiz kit, you can move your algorithms around and um, 
and experiment uh, with different quantum computers to see how your algorithm runs on those quantum computers. Well, what's, well, I don't know, what's the interplay between the software and the computer itself? You know, can good software make squeeze more qubits out of a, uh, a quantum computer or how important is the software and what can it do? Uh, so Ticket actually can squeeze more out of a quantum computer because I mean, this gets complicated. We've built a couple things in to help um, look at the algorithms you've written and optimize them for the quantum computer you're running on. And it can also look at the actual qubits on the quantum computer and say, oh, I like this qubit, but I don't like that qubit and focus what you're running on the better qubits. So it is a way to ring, kind of ring out some extra performance from that quantum computer as well. So retargetable as well as performance enhancing. Interesting. So there's no industry standard for the software that runs quantum computers? Not yet? No, not yet. It's still very much of an emerging industry. So no, no standards. I mean, is the software particularly difficult? Is it, you know, is it super unique because of the nature of the underlying computation? So writing um, software for quantum computers is unique and different than writing software for classical computers, and it is difficult. Um, So it does take someone very skilled in physics and math and computer science to write algorithms. Um, Yes. Okay. Are there um, certain abilities of a quantum computer that, I mean, the whole thing won't work, I guess, without software, but are there any abilities that... uh, right now are, I mean, unusable that would be usable if the right software was created? Is it holding anything back Uh, about quantum computers? So right now, uh, the holdup in quantum computers is the actual size of the device. So a quantum computer uses something called qubits or quantum bits, and that's in comparison to what we know on a classical computer as simply just a bit. Um, So a qubit um, is the... Um, kind of unit of compute almost. And right now, the -the state-of-the-art devices that are out there, there are two uh, devices that have 53 qubits. And a qubit is not the only measure of performance. Um, IBM has actually coined a term called quantum volume. And it's a very complicated complication or uh, computation that looks at Um, not only the number of qubits, but the device performance. And it uses this quantum volume measurement as a way to compare quantum computers to quantum, to other quantum computers, because it's more than qubits. There's error, there's error rates. There's all sorts of factors. So right now the state of the art is a 53 qubit device, which both IBM and Google have, um, and the the quantum the highest quantum volume measurement that we've seen is from IBM, who's shown a device with a quantum volume of 32. Well, I thought there were like some 300 qubit uh, computers made, but I guess uh, I guess not. Huh? No, not yet. Not yet. We're 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 happy at 53. I mean, 53 is pretty amazing. Um, and looking forward to seeing what people have kind of in their back room and will come out with. Um, but right now, 53 is the number. Well, are you able to give some estimate on how powerful uh, a computer is that has, you know, 50 plus qubits in it compared to traditional computing? Oh, so that's really hard. Um, these are what they call noisy intermediate qubits. So there's still a lot of noise. Um, if these were fault tolerant qubits, i.e. we had found a way to manage all the noise, then a 53 qubit device would be uh, faster than the biggest supercomputer um, on, or, you know, right now the fastest supercomputer on the planet is something called Summit. Um, and if we had a 50, a fault tolerant 50 qubit quantum computer, it would be faster than Summit. Um, but right now they're noisy, so it's not faster than Summit, and we have not yet surpassed. Um, these so-called supercomputers or high-performance computers yet. Um, And that's really the excitement about the quantum computing industry is um, as we add qubits, when are we going to reach a point that they call quantum advantage or quantum supremacy when the quantum computer can outperform a supercomputer? 
When you say they're not fault tolerant and they're noisy, what does that mean? Um, it, it just has to do with error rates that um, there is a lot of um, noise and error in getting the qubits to perform. And we still have a lot of, the industry still has a lot of engineering work to do to fix that. So the goal okay. is to be fault tolerant. And so the goal is that we're going to manage that noise one day, but right now we're still working on it. So it's very noisy and we have to use software and all sorts of tricks to manage that noise. Mm. So what's, I mean, what's the equivalent if you've got a one that has 53 qubits with noise and fault tolerances and all that, is it the equivalent of like, I don't know, 35 qubits or is there an estimation? Oh, I can't do that. I think, I think I, I would be wrong no matter what I said. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess it points to the fact that if some company says they have like a, you know, a 53 qubit machine, that could either mean something or not. I guess if their machine is not fault tolerant and has a high error rate, it could be, you know, maybe pretty much useless or something, or not even close to being as effective as, uh, as it could be. Yeah, and so that's why we get to this, that's why I like this measurement from IBM called quantum volume, um, because you're right, if I say I have a 53 qubit device, that's great, but it's just, it's not the number of qubits, there's a lot of these other factors that you have to consider that really show the power of what the device can do. So, you know, all right, so again, what is, what is quantum volume, how does it work, and like, what are the numbers involved in it? Uh, gosh, it's a, it's a big mathematical problem um, where, you, where you look at, um, uh, where you look at error rates, you look at um, ran, uh, circuit width and depth. I mean, it's, it's a complicated calculation in itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, basically that's what I can say. There's a, a protocol where you Um, generate um, sequences, you look at uh, the output, you define noise, you look at gate fidelity and depth, and Mm. from all that data, you would then have a quantum volume number. Okay, but I guess the take-home message is it's a much more accurate or better measure of the real capability of a quantum computer. Exactly, exactly. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So what, what units is the quantum volume expressed in? Like have you heard someone say, oh, it has a quantum volume of X? So it's just a number. Um, you know, I think you and I are, are probably trained in science and we're used to like a num- like it's 62 megahertz or something. But the quantum volume is simply just a number. Um, right now, the highest quantum volume, as I said, is from IBM and it's 32. Um, and I don't, there's no unit attached to that. Um, So it's 32. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So um, there are roadmaps that different vendors publish on um, either they want to show that they want to reach um, X number of qubits in a certain period of time, or um, IBM also publishes, and I feel like I'm an IBM infomercial right now, and I don't want to (laughs) be. Um, but I, but um, IBM is publishing a roadmap of the quantum volume that they want to reach year after year, where they want to double their quantum volume every year. And I don't want to say any more because I, I don't want to speak for a company that I don't work for. So I understand, um, understand. yeah, so let's um, let's switch to Cambridge Quantum. Sure, yeah, sure, sure. Where um, our goal is to use our ticket software to be able to help our customers look at performance on different devices and run their algorithms, either that we've written or they've written, or we've both written together um, Mm. and, uh, and use different um, types of quantum computers to get the best performance and the best results that we can get. Well, it is, you guys are doing, you know, non normal stuff, non traditional stuff. You know, you're doing the software, which, can work with all kinds of companies and quantum computers. You know, you're doing the one-time key key pair device. I mean, so, you know, Cambridge is really innovating and doing all kinds of cool stuff besides just, oh, my quantum computer is bigger than yours type thing. Mine has more qubits than yours. So that's yeah, good. We think, we think what's really interesting is what you do with a quantum computer. So it's kind of the software and the application is really the limitless horizon for us. And so we, we're always looking at 
um, what new applications we can work on and kind of how we can take whatever immature quantum computer there is and make the best of it and what solutions we can find with what is out there today. Mm. So <clears throat> any, any guesses or hints at the roadmap for you guys over the next few years? Is there going to be any big breakthroughs that you're sensing or have been told about? So what, what we're doing is um, we have a number of different areas of focus um, in terms of software. So I've talked about Ticket. And we're using um, Ticket as a platform to develop software in chemistry, where we're doing a lot um, in finance. And we've just started also some research in neurolinguistic programming, um, which is quite innovative. And so the neurolinguistic programming is still very far out on a quantum computer. Um, but we are starting to work with different companies on chemistry problems. Right now, the problems are very small, but as we, um, the quantum devices grow, we're going to be able to address larger and larger chemistry problems. And I think um, what was interesting to me, I came from a high performance computing and supercomputing background. And you kind of think, God, we've built this huge supercomputer and it's got to be able to solve any problem that you throw at it. And actually, the truth is that there still are very many complex problems today in computation that a supercomputer cannot solve. And so you have to kind of twist your mind around that and then start thinking, oh, my gosh. So then there's this whole set of problems that a quantum computer can address that a supercomputer can't. And so that's where Cambridge Quantum is going, is into this realm of um, problems that are very difficult for today's computing and putting a new twist on them and trying to solve them using quantum, um, which everybody agrees has the, has, has the potential and will be able to solve these problems in the future. Any particular ones that you thought were interesting to you that so, really would require quantum computing to solve? Yeah, so I, you know, I'm a, I'm a biologist by trade. Um, so I always look at things like uh, drug discovery or um, protein structure prediction or materials discovery as kind of the holy grail. Um, and that's simply because I'm a biologist and that's really what I've been trained to think about. Um, but there's a lot of other areas in um, computation. So you could look at um, financial modeling, um, the fact that quantum computing will be able to do calculations very fast um, in derivative pricing or in risk analysis um, or um, something in, as simple as optimization. Um, so there's a, a problem called the traveling salesman problem. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah. What's the most efficient route for the person to take? Yeah, exactly. So if I'm a delivering packages and I have 50 packages to deliver today, how, you know, what's the best way to do it? Turns out that that's really a computationally complex problem. And um, we hope and we know that quantum computers are going to be able to address very complex problems like that. And it's exciting because of the implications it has just on a day-to-day -day basis on delivering packages, but you could also think of it as in manufacturing supply chain or optimization or shipping, um, any sort of process that needs has multivariables and that you need to kind of refine. Um, this will help you model it and come up with the most efficient way to solve the problem. Well, very good. Denise, so what's the best way for people to find out more about Cambridge Quantum Computing? Should they go to a website or what do you recommend? Yeah, we have a website. Believe it or not, uh, we have a website. Um, I'm trying to be funny. Um, we have a website with a lot of um, information on our company and on quantum computing. Uh, we have uh, one or two videos on YouTube that you can look up. And I really encourage anybody listening to this podcast to take a few minutes and Google quantum computing and start educating themselves on it. I think that as we move into the future, people are going to be hearing more and more about quantum computing, and it's something we all need to learn about and become familiar with. 
how long do you think until it's uh, pervasive and everyday people are either knowingly or unknowingly interacting with quantum computers? Wow, that's a that's the million dollar question. Um, and I'm optimistic, so I'm going to say five to ten years. Um, I think it's going to start having an impact in three years, but we're going to really start seeing it. I'm going to say ten years from now, everybody's going to know about it. Well, great. Well, Denise, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, nice to talk to you today. You've been listening to the Future Tech Edition of the Finding Genius Podcast. This podcast is information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed. Review us on iTunes or wherever you listen and subscribe today by going to futuretech.findinggeniuspodcast.com.